You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law, and with me, my co-host, Paul Doroshenko. Hi, Kyla. Nice to talk to you. I am uh, back in the studio, and I sure hope that uh, now that we are getting back to some sort of uh, version of normal in the pandemic, that we will be able to actually sit in the studio each week, which will eventually be in the office, and we can record this rather than doing it the strange way we've done it for the last two and a bit years. Yeah, I would like that too. Um, I am not in the studio. I am like living full goblin mode in my house right now because I have been working 14 hours a day since uh, the weekend and I'm exhausted. Yeah, I'll bet you are. Well, uh, we'll record the podcast. You can get some sleep and (laughs) then it'll be Friday. Your song sure has done well this week. Oh my goodness. My song. Oh yeah. I released a song on Monday. I could barely like keep my eyes open on Monday. (laughs) I can't believe how many people uh, watched your song in just a couple of days. I think it's up to 1,300 views on YouTube. Good song. Very good. And uh, I woke up the other day and it was just running through my head. So it's it's an enjoyable earworm. Well, I'm glad that you like it. And some people who commented on the internet also seem to like it. You got all thumbs up. You got 100% thumbs up on it. Well, don't say that. Then the haters will come out and... Yeah, down me. the haters will come out anyway. Sadly, you have haters. That's the way it goes. Um, so what are we talking about? Well, I thought we would start with um, it's sort of an extension of many things that have been happening lately. Um, but the, the biggest sort of story has been this issue of crime in British Columbia. And I know you're thinking, but Kyla, this is not driving law, but it is because crime is, you know, driving is crime. Driving offenses are crime. And it's also going to impact driving law issues. For sure. So um, most driving started. offenses in my mind um, are not necessarily properly categorized as crime, but they are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not things that people set out to do. And oftentimes it's a mistake and it's a, or it's a negligence thing, or it's a, uh, uh, Cal- uh, thinking you can do something that you can't do or getting yourself into a condition or state that you shouldn't drive in. And of course you've lost your capacity to make good decisions at that point. Yeah. Still crimes. Sure. I mean, it's all, it's all crime. It's all criminal. Um, don't, don't commit crimes. But Good advice. <laughs> you come here for that advice. <laughs> Log into the podcast and learn the good advice from Kyla Lee. Don't commit crimes. That People on the internet are always thinking that you're encouraging people to commit crimes, and here you are. And here I am, not encouraging crime. No, but what I wanted to talk about was um, this issue kind of started with um, the mayors in the urban centers in British Columbia penning a joint letter to the Attorney General of British Columbia asking for the Attorney General to end our catch-and-release justice system. Uh Aha. So, yeah, we've had a problem, and it's gotten worse in Vancouver. There's been so much property. Well, look at our old office just became, like, completely, downtown became so inhospitable because of the property crime. Your car was broken into, my car was broken into. We went years without that ever happening. Next thing you know, and they, you know, there's phone the police and they say, don't even bother phoning. Whereas in the old days, they used to record those things and create a file number and so forth. Now they tell you, don't even bother doing it. So, you know, I get the sense that property crime was way up. I also get the sense that they're not keeping good records of it anymore. Well, of course not. But they also um, looked at the Vancouver Police Department statistics for the first quarter of 2022, that's the year we're in, yes, Um, and uh, and crime is actually down. Yes, 
Um, but again, an issue of enforcement, like you and I notice every year in February that enforcement drops off because the police put all this effort into enforcement just before Christmas. Uh, and then they, they think, oh, we have to start doing some of these other things, training and things like that. Some people are, are off and we're working overtime over Christmas. So they were catching people drinking and driving. Um, we don't see a whole lot of roadblocks and things like that in February and March. And that's part of the first quarter, right? Mm -hmm. So is it down year over year or is it down over quarter? So it's down over the quarter, um, not year over year. But when they say, when Vancouver police released the the statistics, they actually said that crime was up. Um, But if you look at the statistics, and Justin McElroy did a good breakdown of this on, um, on his Twitter account. If you look at the statistics, crime is not actually up. Crime is up over the three-year average from 2019 to 2021, mm-hmm. or sorry, the 2018 to 2021. So like pre-pandemic times and pandemic times factored in there. So not a very good comparator because you're comparing like a period that is combining two completely ridiculous um, events and skewing the statistics. So, I mean, it's a little bit silly. Um, their claim that crime is up. I think there is a perception that criminal activity is up when it's not, in fact, increasing, but it's concentrating now in certain specific locations. But, but I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't agree with you. And the reason I don't agree with you is the point that I made a moment ago. And that is that I don't think the statistics are comparable because I don't think that they're keeping the same records that they did in previous times. You know, we, you and I, both in the last three years, our cars were, had our windows smashed out and more than once. yours was twice. Yeah. Um, and, you had uh, more than one too. Uh, yeah, I did in, in the, in the minivan. So the, um, the, the, those are things that, uh, if it was 15 years ago, uh, you phoned the Vancouver police, they would create a file number. They would have a record. There'd be no need for it in the end because they weren't sending a police officer out to check on your car, but you needed that file number to report it to ICBC. Now they no longer do that. They looked at it and decided, you know what, we're not even going to bother keeping track with this. And so they're comparing apples and oranges because they're looking at, at historical records that showed much more crime because they were recording it. And people have got the message in Vancouver that there's no point in phoning the police so they don't, they don't yeah. even bother. Like, I, do I, I bother. bother? I don't bother phoning the police. I mean, I you know, I see all sorts of crimes now. I don't bother phoning yeah. the police almost never. Um, yeah. The other day I was driving home from the office. Uh, I went down uh, stairs and there was a car parked in our parking spot that wasn't supposed to be there. Mm-hmm. And it looked kind of funny. And I stopped. Uh, I was driving to the office and I saw a police van there. I don't know if I, I've said this. I've, you know, told you a couple told people. Me, yeah. yeah. And I stopped and I walked over to the officers and I said, are you looking for a white Jetta? And they said, yeah. And meanwhile, they were just parked there, right? Like they weren't driving around the neighborhood. It was only a block away. There was two different police vehicles there. If they'd been driving around, they probably would have spotted it. But in any event, the uh, point is that, you know, I wouldn't have reported that white Jetta that looked potentially stolen in my parking spot, but for the fact that I drove by some police vehicles. I wouldn't have phoned it in, but a decade ago, I might have phoned it in. Um, Okay. You know. That story was not as exciting <laughs> the third time I've heard it. <laughs> um, but, mm. oh, sorry. It's, I it's not supposed point. to be exciting. The point, I'm, the, yeah, so what's my point? Your point is that people aren't reporting crime because they feel discouraged about the fact that the police aren't doing anything. But isn't that kind of like you taking the side of the mayors? Because the mayors are like, hey. We don't need catch and release justice. We need police investigating crimes and courts detaining offenders. And what I wanted to talk about about this was a little bit of a discussion for the uninitiated on who makes these decisions about what happens to people if they are apprehended for criminal offenses. We can discuss that. I mean, mostly these are mental health and and drug issues, and the police and the justice system are completely incapable of handling them. And I don't know why we ever thought that they would be. Um, and yet, it's you know, this is we've got that market, you know, locked up. Uh, the police are getting paid to do this, and that's their you know been their job, and for whatever reason, it's never been questioned. 
Um, and the uh, the courts, we've got the monopoly on this. We call it justice. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we're not helping these people at all. Okay. So... There's my rant. Sorry. I'm sure you had something else you wanted to say. But. Yeah. Well, I wanted to stay on topic. <laughs> um, catch and release justice. So what people are referring to when they say catch and release justice is the idea that people will commit a crime and that after they commit the crime... A police officer will hand them a piece of paper and say, okay, you promised you're going to come to court, right? Here's your court date. That's catch and release justice. And sometimes, you know, there's another step to it where uh, they get um, arrested and then they get brought into court. And then a judge says, okay, well, you know, here's a list of things you shouldn't do for the period while your charges are before the court and promise me you're going to come back to court on another day. And okay, you can be released. And people perceive that in much the way I've described it. Like it's kind of like a joke. But it's not a joke, Paul. It is a constitutional right. And I have a big concern, tying this back to driving law, I have a big concern um, both with the approach of mayors trying to influence the attorney general to influence decisions that are made by judicial actors, which... Is wrong. And it shouldn't happen. But also, with the idea that um, catch and release justice is somehow bad, because you know what happens when a large sector of the public or influential people who attract the attention of large sectors of the public, like mayors, local politicians, internet celebrities, um, when those people start pointing to a problem in a justice system, where does the government go to try and create the perception that they are fixing the non-existent problem? I don't know, Kyla. Where do they go? Well, if time has told us anything, Paul, it's drivers. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I don't know where you're going with that, but drivers oh, are the low-hanging fruit when it comes to drunk driving. Drivers are the low-hanging fruit when it comes to drunk driving. They're it's the easy. easiest target. Everybody hates them. Exactly. Everybody hates drunk drivers. Any bad so law, any bad kill a baby. should be a, a law that would otherwise be considered unconstitutional in any other sphere. It will be just fine if it's in the sphere of regulating, mm -hmm. trying to stop drunk drivers because they're they're the they're the worst curse. They're the worst in society. It's worse than worse on than our road. worse than firearms and worse than you name it. They're the worst yeah. thing ever. Well, I mean, look, all this other stuff in Vancouver, if you try and, if you're in Vancouver in British Columbia, if you try and say, you know, these property crime issues, um, we're going to apprehend people. Obviously people, smart, right-minded, <laughs> good thinking people like you and me are going to go, this is ridiculous. You can't just like lodge people in cells because of mental health and systemic issues that are um, causing them to commit property offenses and causing random acts of violence on the streets. Like that we know clearly the connection is to larger systemic problems and, you know, untreated and, and unsupported mental health and addictions problems and poison drug supply. So the failure that has led to those people committing offenses is on society. But with drunk drivers, nobody views it that way. With That's drivers, true. nobody views it that way. Yeah. And so I am worried when I see things like this, that the government is not, obviously, they're not going to be able to turn around and go, well, courts, you can't release uh, people who are, who are charged with this. Now they can instruct police forces not to release people PTA, and fair enough, they're still going to get released in court. But who is somebody who commits crime, that causes damage, that takes its toll, that everybody hates, that is consistently, almost with certainty in every single case, released PTA? Drivers. Yeah, but I mean, in BC, 90% of impaired driving cases are immediate roadside prohibitions, which are, of course, sure. automatically released. They get their 90-day driving prohibition, 30-day vehicle impound, and they're back on the bar stool the very next night. But sure. they're not driving. Sure, but there are also the, you know, couple hundred every month impaired driving charges that are laid. 
So what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that you're concerned that they're going to start detaining them to bring them in front of a justice rather than just yes. giving them an appearance notice or an undertaking? Yes. And then what they're going to do is play fast and loose with stats the same way they're doing now. And they're going to say Vancouver police has been releasing fewer offenders. Our police forces have been releasing fewer people who are arrested for violent crimes because, let's not forget, the Harper government reclassified impaired driving as violent crime. Uh, yeah. Um, I will wait to see if it plays out that way. I'm, I don't know how they're going to deal with this. I, you know, the, the problem that we've got and we've seen it, you know, remember the liquor store on Pacific. I remember being in there and a guy walked in, grabbed two bottles of whiskey and walked out. And I took chase after him and the security guard, like just took chase for three meters, but I kept chasing the guy. And I went back in there and I asked him why you don't chase. He said, it happens a few times a day. There's nothing we can do about it. We don't even bother phoning the police. Uh, we're at a level now where, you know, <laughs> we just, the, 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 there's nothing we can do. The police are, if the police catch them, yeah, of course they will be released. But most of the time we don't even bother trying to catch them. So, you know, it, it makes sense to, if you're, if you're struggling in that circumstance and you're living, uh, uh, you know, living the difficult life with whatever issues you're dealing with, it just makes sense to, to commit those crimes. And we don't seem to have the capacity to stop it. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the deterrent capacity, um, with the catch and release. And we of course don't have the capacity to actually, or we don't have, we've never put in the effort to, to deal with the problems that people have. Now I have to say, you know, the thing about drunk drivers versus the thing about some other criminals is, you know, some people set out to actually commit crimes, right? You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a rare occasion, but there's some people who plot crimes, plot lengthy, spend lengthy periods to plot crimes. And you and I and 99% of the population can't even wrap our minds around it. And when we see it and we find it, and even when they come to us to hire us, you know, it's hard for you to, to, your first thought is to give them the benefit of the doubt and like something's going wrong. But there's a small group of the population who are just like, they look at everybody else as, as potential suckers and, uh, who they can, they can victimize. No, it's, it's I, I disagree with you on this as well. See, I think 90% of the population is sitting there plotting crimes, but most of us don't act on them. I mean, don't you sit around all day and be like, no, I could, you know, I could, I could steal a car. Here's how I do it. I don't. And then you never do. I don't. I don't. I don't do that. I mean, really? I, yeah, no, I don't. You don't like consider how to commit the perfect crime? No, I don't waste my time thinking about those things. Well, wow. those thought exercises I did when I was a kid and, you know, sometimes my kids talk about it and I explain all the different ways that the police know how to catch people doing everything. <laughs> um, you know, it's like the drive while prohibited clients yeah. who persuade themselves that they can, I'll just go to the Yukon, get a license and then I'll be fine. Uh, I'll register my truck in my, in my, in my girlfriend's, girlfriend's name. name. I'll be fine. Yeah. They'll never know. They'll never figure it out. Never uh, know. The, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I stopped doing that when I was a kid. All right. Well, speaking, this is actually a great transition. Because speaking of imagining crimes and trying to alleviate uh, the public's uh, concern about non-existent problems in our legal system, yeah, the federal government just passed some law that creates new crimes. Yay! Um, and specifically... Under the uh, Budget Implementation Act, Parliament has passed a law that now allows the government of Canada to prosecute people who commit crimes on the moon. Oh, my God. Yes. Crimes on the moon. Well, you know, we're planning on putting some people on the moon for a little bit to, like, chill, I guess. I don't know. Like, I don't really pay attention to space. Well, stuff. I know that we've got a, there's a trip planned to the moon and it's supposed to be a Canadian astronaut on one of these trips. I mean, the Americans are going to circle the moon and they plan on landing on the moon again. They want to get back to the moon, probably want to get there before China or Russia can put another yeah. flag on, put a flag on there and claim it. Maybe they want to um, Christmas so, on the moon. Sure. Christmas on the moon. Uh, good idea. The, um, 
uh, but remember there was some crime in from the space station. Somebody uttered a threat or somebody something. Yeah, in a, yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah, so I suppose that's the motivation. But my goodness, the moon. Yeah. Anyway, so the the the, pos- the probability of somebody who gets through the whole space training thing and gets selected to go to space on Canada's as Canada's designated person on the lunar mission committing a crime and needing to be prosecuted for that crime is like so remote that the idea that parliament actually wasted time debating this that some like legislative assistant spent time writing this and putting it in the budget implementation act you met an astronaut i met mark garneau i don't think he's ever going to commit a crime well so Mark Garneau won't trade seats on a plane. No, not no. no that's not Mark Garneau. Oh wait, that's you, Chris Hatfield. You were yeah. with Chris, well, Hat- Chris Hatfield. Yeah, he won't. You've trade met seats Chris on Hatfield. I've met Mark Garneau. So the uh, the um, yeah, okay, all right. So crimes on the moon. Which courthouse is it going to be? Like the courthouse on the moon? Is it going to be better, in Crater better, Six? Federal court. Crater Six. <laughs> Crater Six courthouse. Who's the Who's the? It's on the, the dark side of the moon. It. At PPSC, who has to uh, prosecute the moon crime? Like, can we can we devote a section of our website? Oh my gosh. To crimes on the moon. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yep, we can you do that. A crime? Moon on crime. Moon. moon crime. Okay, we'll get uh, we'll get the team that writes the blog posts on that one. Yeah. Um, no. So are they gonna have so, what, what? What are they gonna have for enforcement up there? One fucking poor soul RCMP officer sitting there. Sitting there and is sitting in her cruiser way. <laughs> I thought that this would be a really interesting time to in our imaginary crime discussion that has potential real world connections to talk about how now, in theory, and not just in theory, but like probably you could be charged. With impaired operation of a conveyance on the moon. Impaired driving on the moon. Okay, well, let's say there's a few problems with that. Um, I can I can see it happening. I could see somebody sneaking a bottle of uh, a vodka up there. Why not? Um, you know, the moon's going to be there for a while. It might happen in 10 years. It might happen in 50 years. It might happen in 100 years. It'll be the ridiculous driver of the week when it happens. Um, but, um, a few problems there. First of all, you have to have the equipment to test people to enforce it. And what are you going to do? Standardized field sobriety tests in a space suit. <laughs> okay. So I, I, yeah, carry on. Tell, name your problems. So I have a solution. I think that's Great issue number them. one, because first of all, uh, the walk and turn, I mean, you're dealing with different gravity. Um, the, uh, the, the finger to nose, you can't put your finger to your nose cause you got a, you know, a, a mask over your face or uh, not just a mask. I mean, you're in a complete space suit. Um, yeah. then, uh, you look at those, uh, oh, Wrigley's bark and you look at those, uh, the, the, the actual visor thing that they're looking through and it's reflective because they want to reflect away the, the damaging radiation from the sun cause there's no atmosphere there. So you can't see the person's eyes. Mm-hmm. to do horizontal gaze nystagmus. Mm-hmm. So if uh, Bob the astronaut decides to pound back some vodka, get out there and drive around in the space in the moon car, um, you're going to have trouble assessing it. Now, how are you going to do a breath test? Um, uh, uh, FSS, uh, 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 FST or ASD test, rather. Um, you'd have to have him list, lift his mask. Well, that's it. That's death right there. Um, okay. get them back into the, uh, into the lunar capsule to do it maybe, but by the time you do, is it really forthwith anymore? And you know, this detention and then, then what about, how do you, how do you, uh, facilitate someone's right to counsel? Remember, I mean, uh, criminal lawyers are written right into the, into the charter of rights. A person has their I right can, to counsel. Are they going to do a zoom meeting? I, I mean, I, I suppose I, I can, I can solve all of these problems. And then all. finally you have okay. to have 110 volts and you have to have a consistent power supply to be able to operate a, an approved instrument. Um, and how are you going to do that? So okay. I so just don't see it happening. These, none of these problems that you identify are actually problems with uh, prosecution 
on the moon for impaired operation of a conveyance. Because, yeah, you you would probably have difficulty with an over-80 charge, especially because I'm sure that there are a ton of involuntary intoxication issues because I doubt there's much study on how BAC might be different when alcohol is I don't think that's I don't think that's a defense because you still got yourself in that I let you finish. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Sure, you don't want me to mansplain? I'm no, I don't do want it. you to mansplain. Okay. Because um, I'm going to mansplain to you. Okay. Womansplain, which means I'm right. Um, so you're talking about performing the test. You're talking about doing an SFST. You're talking about doing an ASD or a breath test. You have a problem with the foundational premise of your saying this wouldn't work. And that's a, a common misconception that many people hold, which is that you need some sort of a test to prove impairment. In fact, you don't. You don't need a test result to prove that somebody's impaired. Impairment can be proven by indicia. And you also don't need necessarily to put somebody in touch with counsel because observations of indicia can be made by lay people who have obviously general knowledge acquired through human experience of what drunk people look like. Um, and presumably astronauts know what drunk people look like. So if you saw Timmy the astronaut drinking a bottle of vodka and then hopping into the lunar cart to, you know, joyride on the moon while drunk, he doesn't need to be arrested. There doesn't need to be a breath test or an SFST test or anything like that. Um, the observations of that and the lay observations of fellow astronauts would be sufficient evidence for the impairment. Further, you don't need to have him get out of the, um, get out of the, whatever, the pod or whatever it is on the moon, um, necessarily because of the Criminal Code of Canada's definition of a conveyance, which includes yeah. aircraft which would then include spacecraft. Yeah, but if you're just sitting in your spacecraft, you don't. there's nothing there, right? That's care and control. Operation is defined as including care and control. So if you're just sitting in your spacecraft... Poor you're Karen. Damned, Poor Karen. And you're off, and you're off of it's... the moon, you have committed an offense. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think so. That would mean that if you were sitting in your mo motor home and you're sitting in the back of your motor home uh, and you're in your kitchen of your motor home um, and you got yourself over 80 milligrams or got yourself impaired, then that, that would mean that you were committing the offense. I don't see that. Well, I don't here's see the thing. That. I've had numerous clients who have, you know, vehicles that you can live in in some way, like, you know, those, those long haul truckers with the sleeper cabins. Yeah. Things like that. I've had numerous clients charged for being impaired in those vehicles. So, in fact, it is uh, something that could get you charges. Well, uh, I still think it's unlikely, and I think you'd have problems getting the uh, getting Dudley Do right up there to make the arrest. So uh, you don't need an arrest. This is my point. You well, don't need an arrest. You don't need to arrest. That's true. I suppose. Anyway, the uh, I I I'm just uh, saying. I want to defend a DUI on the moon. Of course you do. So basically, <laughs> what I'm telling you is, if you're going to the moon, um, I I would encourage you to be the first one. And I don't encourage crimes generally. Um, but you know, um, you know, have a few drinks and drive. You maybe you're not impaired. Maybe you are. Uh, if you are, then I can tell you right now, as far as I'm concerned, you're not going to get convicted. I think you've got a very good chance of beating this hypothetical charge uh, based on uh, a, a failure to collect the proper evidence. And, um, and the fact that all of the other astronauts are basically government agents uh, right then, and uh, and they're spying on you, and I I think that's completely unlawful too. And I also I also still don't know which courthouse you're going to go to. Um, if you, I mean, I, I could pick one, we could pick some sort of, maybe it'll be Campbell river or something like that. Maybe that's I'm, closest to the moon tonight. <laughs> I'm a little offended, Paul, that you in this hypothetical have not attributed somebody not being convicted to my skills as the top moon drunk driving lawyer that exists. 
Well, I know that well, these are all things that you would do and that you would succeed on it. But I, I also think that, you know, maybe I would succeed as well. I may not be the lawyer you are, Kyla, but um, I, you know, I might be able to pull this one off. So we're done with Moon Law. We're done with Moon Law. Okay. We are moving on to one real law, one non-imaginary law. And that's uh, in BC um, now, as of May 1st, you no longer will have to put a decal on your license plate. But that's the only way I know when my insurance is going to expire. Yeah. Can I put a post-it note? Sure. I mean, you can put the decal on if you want. We should make our own Acumen Law decals to go over the decals that are on there. If you don't have to put the decal on anymore, you should be able to put something else. Probably illegal. Defended by AccuLaw. No? Yeah, okay. Well, maybe. Um, so but, how is this? Yeah. Why is this? What has happened? Because, well, during the pandemic, um, when everything was remote, people were having a problem where they needed to renew their insurance, but they couldn't get the decal because you have to be in person to get the decal. Which is, was so, always just ridiculous. Like, they, Yeah. <laughs> the decal is the stupidest thing ever because, as you and I both know, the police don't look at the decal to determine whether you have active insurance. They run your plate. Yeah. And your plate comes back as either having active insurance or not. And then based on what comes back on the plate, the police either take enforcement action or they don't. And they don't, like, if you have an expired decal on there or you don't have a decal but your insurance is active, the worst that they're going to give you is an $81 ticket that has no penalty points. So it doesn't, like, there's no deterrent effect. No. Which it's time for my big confession. You know what I'm about to confess. Yes, I've heard this story three times. I'm so tired of it. But you go ahead. <laughs> Every year, I when I renew my insurance, I do not put my decal on. And I drive around without a decal on to see how long it takes before the police give me a ticket for not having a decal. And uh, it's never happened. Um, usually, it ends up getting put on because some busybody stop saying it's like you don't have a decal oh my god your insurance expired like six months ago and i feel you know shamed by like the person staring at me when i'm like it's in the glove box and they expectantly want me to put it on okay i'll put it on or or you know my dad putting it on for me because <laughs> he gets annoyed um but yeah, like I've even had police officers roll my roll down the window next to me and, and go, someone stole your decal. I'm like, no, I just didn't put it on. So, okay. <laughs> and they drive off, right? Like it's not a thing. I think somebody did steal my decal, but maybe I just okay. forgot. Maybe you, you know. forgot. Um, never got a ticket for it. I, I have had clients who were charged with stealing decals. Yes. That's a long time ago though. I don't even think the police even consider the decal and I don't think they've considered it for for forever. They're just driving around, typing license plates in, typing license plates in. They get bored at an intersection, they're typing license plates in. Or not even typing them in because ALTR will tell you if it's not got active insurance. Depends on where you are, obviously, if they have that and all the, so many of the RCMP cars, yes. So, there decal, you go. Decals are gone. I wonder how people are going to feel about that. Well, look, back in the day, um, when, uh, even when I just I guess just before I started, so in the, probably in the early eighties, they created the decal. But before that, you got a brand new license plate every year in Alberta. Really? And yeah. And in BC too, you'd get a new license plate. You'd go in to renew your, your, uh, registration, which was totally separate from your insurance. And they would give you a new plate and you'd swap your plate. And so that's why you can find old license plates all over the place, or at least you could for a long time. Um, there was not even a space for a decal. And then they created little corners for a decal and then in BC in the center. Um, but the, um, yeah, I mean, my my first set of plates, I guess, was probably right around the time they introduced the decal in, in uh, 84. And I think it was only a few years before that, that they had introduced it. And so I had a big stack of license plates and I still have them of antique license plates where there's no space for a decal and there was no decal. Well, there you go. See, the decal never needed to be in existence evolution well no it did because we didn't have computers and they didn't have computers in cars so it was one way to identify whether or not somebody had registered their your car insurance. you can pull them over for to check that they have insurance <sighs> yeah that's uh very intrusive 
and unnecessary. And now they don't do it. So that's one thing that's improved in our surveillance world where they can just type in your vehicle and plate and find out who you are right there as they're driving around. Yes. Anyway, um, it is now time. I'm sure you can hear the ridiculous sound in the background. Yeah. Which is telling me that my dog is done eating, but also that it's time for the ridiculous driver of the week. The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah. Um, this one you found, and it is fucking hilarious. It is hilarious. Wanna, do you yeah. want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah, I could. I mean, it's a... Um... I should pull it up. So I've got it there. Uh, It's a woman named Jennifer Cunningham and she was pulled over in Dixon County, Tennessee by the Dixon County Sheriff uh, for impaired driving. She ran over a mailbox or something like that. And at the time that they were investigating her and they handcuffed her uh, and lodged her in the back seat of the cruiser. And then they were outside probably looking at, you know, the scene as police officers often do. They seem to mull around and You wonder what's going on and often they, you know, somebody runs out and gets coffee and then they come back and they mull around some more. Uh, And as they are mulling around, uh, she managed to get the handcuffs off one hand and squeeze through the silent patrolman. So there's that heavy duty sheet of plastic that divides the front uh, and the uh, back seats of the police car where presumably they're putting people who are in big trouble. Uh, And um, she managed to squeeze through there. I don't know how, and got in the car and apparently, uh, they really, they realized it, you know, there's body cam. They realized that she got <laughs> to the front and then she drove ahead and hit the other, uh, cruiser that was there. So, um, that's the first time that I can think of in my career as a DUI lawyer, uh, that, uh, I recall a story where the person, um, tried to steal the police car, tried to drive away with the police car. I mean, I do, I do love it. I especially love, you know, that she got the handcuffs off and then managed to squeeze through that tiny uh, thing. And there's a video of the police being interviewed about it. And their response is like, well, she's a very small woman. (laughs) Well, did no one consider this when you designed this? They could have put a bar right through the center there. I don't know. Um, you know, I just don't think it's something that's likely. I don't think, I don't think they have to panic and reconfigure all of their cars. <laughs> like they reconfigured the, they're like, they reconfigured the, uh, the doors to get into the flight deck of, uh, commercial airplanes or something like that, just because this one woman managed to do it. Um, the, uh, most of the time, perspective, most of the is- time people get handcuffs on and the handcuffs are like crushing their wrists and causing them extreme pain. And, uh, often police put them on in a manner that, uh, that is like some sort of punishment at the roadside there, punishment of before ever getting to court. Um, you know, most people can't get their wrists out of it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I think it was, I think she should get some sort of, some sort of award. I guess she just did because she's the ridiculous driver of the week. Well, special I, recognition. I... I want to put the feminist perspective out here. This is one of the many unforeseen consequences of designing a world for men. Well, we just assume that women are not going to be as bad as men. Look at uh, Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard. I mean, everybody just assumed that she was telling the truth. She was a woman. Maybe Um, she was telling the truth. It's not over yet. Yeah, that recording is pretty damning. Um, And they played it today. Uh, I haven't seen the recording. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty damning. Um, she's like, who would believe you? Abused male. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess we just assume that men are the bad guys. Sometimes yeah. it's women are the bad guys. <laughs> yep. Well, that's our podcast. Wrigley's telling me it's time for me to continue paying attention to him and not to you or our listeners, but... If you want me to pay attention to you on your driving law-related issue, you can give me a call at 604-685-8889 or find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law. (laughs) 